This video provides an overview of the major concepts covered in Chapter 12, Market Microstructure and Strategies. Recently, much attention has been given to market microstructure, which is the process by which securities such as stocks are traded. For a stock market to function properly, a structure is needed to facilitate the placing of orders, speed the transaction of trades ordered, and provide equal access to information for all investors. Chapter 12 includes five key learning objectives. First, to describe the common types of stock transactions. Second, to explain how stock transactions are executed. Third, to describe high-frequency trading. Fourth, to describe the regulation of stock transactions. And fifth, to explain how barriers to international stock transactions have been reduced. Let's begin with stock market transactions. To place an order to buy or sell a specific stock, an investor contacts a brokerage firm, which serves as the intermediary between buyers and sellers of stocks in the secondary market. The broker may provide a bid quote if the investor wants to sell a stock or an ask quote if the investor wants to buy. The investor communicates the order to the broker by specifying the name of the stock, whether to buy or sell that stock, the number of shares to be bought or sold, and whether the order is a market or limit order. A market order to buy or sell a stock means to execute the transaction at the best possible price, whereas a limit order places a limit on the price at which a stock can be purchased or sold. A stop-loss order is a particular type of limit order whereby the investor specifies a selling price that's below the current market price of the stock. An order will be executed and become a market order only if the stock price drops to the specified level. Investors generally place stop-loss orders to either protect gains or to limit losses. A stop buy order is another type of limit order where the investor specifies a purchase price that's above the current market price. An order will be executed and become a market order only if the stock price rises to the specified level. Finally, many internet brokers accept orders online, provide real-time quotes, and provide access to information about stocks. When an investor places an order, they may consider purchasing the stock on margin, meaning that they make a purchase using funds borrowed from their broker along with their own cash. Because of the potential for margin calls, a large volume of margin lending exposes the stock markets to the potential for a crisis. A major downturn in the market could result in many margin calls, some of which may force investors to sell their stock holdings if they don't have enough cash to increase their maintenance margin. This selling can cause the stock price to decline, resulting in more sale of stocks, continued downward pressure on stock prices, and additional margin calls. The return on a stock is affected by the proportion of the investment that is from borrowed funds. Over short-term periods, the return R on stocks purchased on margin can be estimated as the selling price of the stock, SP, less the initial investment excluding borrowed funds, INV, less loan payments on borrowed funds, loan, plus dividend payments, D, all divided by the initial investment, INV. Consider a stock priced at $40 that pays an annual dividend of $1 per share. An investor purchases the stock on margin, paying $20 per share and borrowing the remainder from the brokerage firm at 10% annual interest. If, after one year, the stock is sold at a price of $60 per share, the return on the stock is 95%. Of course, losses are magnified when borrowed funds are used to invest in stocks. Assume that the investor in this example sells the stock at a price of $30 per share instead of $60 at the end of the year. If the investor didn't use any borrowed funds when purchasing the stock at $40 per share at the beginning of the year, the return on this investment would be negative 22.5%. However, if the investor had purchased the stock on margin at the beginning of the year, paying $20 per share and borrowing from the brokerage firm at 10% interest, the return over the year would be negative 55%. In a short sale, investors place an order to sell or short a stock that they don't own in anticipation of a decline in price. When they sell short, investors essentially borrow the stock from another investor through a brokerage firm, and ultimately have to return that stock to the investor from whom they borrowed it. If the price of the stock declines by the time the short sellers purchase it in the market, then the short seller earns the difference between the price at which they initially sold the stock and the price they paid to obtain the stock. Short sellers must also make payments to the investor from whom the stock was borrowed to cover the dividend payments that the investor would have received if the stock had not been borrowed. After subtracting any dividend payments made, the short seller's profit is the difference between the original selling price and the price paid for the stock. One measure of the degree of short positions for a stock is the ratio of the number of shares that are currently sold short divided by the total number of shares outstanding. 
Investors who have established a short position commonly use stop buy order to limit their losses. When the credit crisis intensified in 2008, hedge funds and other investors took large short positions on many stocks, especially those of financial institutions. Now, some critics argue that these large short sales placed additional downward pressure on prices and created paranoia in the stock market. Such fear could make stock prices decline to a greater degree, which would be beneficial to short sellers. Following the massive short sales in 2008, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, introduced a number of restrictions. However, those rules did not prevent opportunistic short-selling activities whenever circumstances were right to do so. The next key concept in the chapter relates to how stock transactions are executed. Floor brokers work from the floor of a stock exchange where they execute orders for their firm's clients. Designated market makers, or DMMs, can serve a broker function by matching up buy and sell orders, thereby facilitating trading on the exchanges. They benefit from the difference or the spread between the bid and ask prices, which is commonly measured as a percentage of the ask price. The spread is influenced by five factors, which include order costs, inventory cost, competition, volume, and risk. Order costs are the cost of processing orders, including clearing costs and the cost of recording transactions. Inventory costs include the cost of maintaining an inventory of a particular stock. For stocks traded on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, having multiple market makers promotes competition. When more market makers are competing to sell a particular stock, the spread is likely to be smaller. Stocks that are more liquid have less chance of experiencing an abrupt change in price, and stocks that have larger trading volume are more liquid because a sufficient number of buyers and sellers are available for stocks at any time. This liquidity makes it easier to sell a stock at any point in time, which in turn reduces the risk of a sudden decline in the stock's price. If the firm represented by a stock has relatively risky operations, its stock price is normally more volatile. Thus, a market maker is subject to more risk when holding inventory of this type of stock and therefore will set a higher spread. Electronic communications networks, or ECNs, are automated systems for disclosing and sometimes executing stock trades. The SEC requires that any quote provided by a market maker be made available to all market participants, which eliminates the practice of providing more favorable quotes exclusively to proprietary clients and also results in significantly lower spreads between quoted bid and ask prices. A direct access broker is a trading platform on a website that allows investors to trade stocks without the use of a broker. The website itself serves as the broker and interacts with ECNs that can execute the trade. Dark pools are platforms that use software to connect buyers and sellers of stocks. They operate much like private stock markets that can be used by institutional investors and can't be monitored by others. Now let's talk about high frequency trading or HFT. High frequency trading represents the use of electronic platforms to execute orders based on an algorithm with programmed instructions. One common form of HFT is program trading which is broadly defined as a computerized response by institutional investors to either buy or sell a large basket of stocks in response to movements in a particular stock index. High-frequency traders use computer systems for accessing stock market information and interpreting that information. These systems are commonly referred to as bots. High-frequency trading may cause share prices to reach a new equilibrium more rapidly. To the extent that this trading quickly corrects for price discrepancies, it could smooth stock price movements over time, thereby reducing stock price volatility. On some occasions, however, market stock price conditions appear to have triggered an unusually heavy volume of program trading and other forms of HFT that spooked the market and jolted stock prices. For example, on May 6, 2010, stock prices declined abruptly and now it's referred to as the flash crash, which is believed to have been triggered by HFT. Overall stocks declined by more than 9% on average before reversing and recovering most of those losses on that same day when more than 19 billion shares are traded. The flash crash is not the only example of a disruption in trading likely caused by HFT. For example, a computer breakdown and computerized trading on August 1, 2012 caused trading of all NASDAQ stocks to be halted for three hours. Another example, on January 25, 2013, a minor flash crash occurred when Apple stock price declined abruptly, causing its market value to decline by approximately $7 billion before recovering. Given traders' heavy reliance on computers to interpret information and to initiate new orders, some critics are concerned that an error in a computer ordering system could cause much panic in financial markets. Although HFT may allow the stock market to work more efficiently in some ways, it may also allow some traders with faster trading speed to gain an advantage over other traders. 
Several financial writers have described how some traders use HFT to gain advantages over others, partially stemming from the multiple stock markets in which a particular stock can trade, and the differences in speed at which the traders can access trading information and submit orders. Many high-frequency traders are willing to serve as intermediaries by accommodating orders that they believe will ultimately result in profits. For example, they might accommodate a sell order by purchasing the stock if their algorithm senses that the stock price will rise in the next few seconds or minutes, at which time they could close out their position with another investor. This practice is known as front-running. Thus, they commonly participate in trades in which they essentially replace market makers. In fact, high-frequency traders have taken market share from the market makers because of the large spreads quoted by market makers in the past. These spreads have declined as a result of the participation by high-frequency traders. Now let's move on to discuss regulation of stock trading. The regulation of stock markets is necessary to ensure that investors are treated fairly. Without regulation, trading abuses might potentially discourage many investors from participating in the market. To promote stability in the market, stock exchanges can impose circuit breakers, which are restrictions on the trading when stock prices or a stock index reaches a specified threshold level with the intention of temporarily stopping the trading of stocks in response to a large decline in stock prices within a single day. Stock exchanges may also impose trading halts on particular stocks when they believe stock market participants need more time to receive and absorb material information that could affect the stock's value. For investors below the highest tax bracket, dividends and long-term capital gains are taxed at a maximum of 15% for federal taxes whereas investors in the highest tax bracket pay a tax rate of 20% on dividends and long-term capital gains. The Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 gave the SEC authority to monitor the exchanges and required illicit companies to file a registration statement and financial reports with the SEC and the exchanges. The SEC consists of five commissioners who meet to assess whether existing regulations are successfully preventing the abuses and to revise the regulations as needed. The SEC has several important divisions that attempt to ensure a fair and orderly stock market. In October 2000, the SEC issued Regulation Fair Disclosure, or FD, which requires firms to disclose relevant information broadly to investors at the same time to ensure a firm may no longer provide analysts with information that they can use before the market becomes aware of the information. Insiders at publicly traded companies sometimes have information about the company that has not yet been publicized. It's illegal for these investors to take positions in the stock or pass the information on to others based on their inside information, because this would give them an unfair advantage over other investors. The last major concept in the chapter relates to trading international stocks. Although the international trading of stocks has grown over time, it's been limited by three barriers, transaction costs, information costs, and exchange rate risk. Now, although exchange rate risk still exists, transaction and information costs have been reduced. Most countries have their own stock exchanges where the stocks of local, publicly held companies are traded. In recent years, countries have consolidated their exchanges, increasing their efficiency and thereby reducing the transaction costs. Information about foreign stocks is now available on the internet, enabling investors to make more informed decisions without having to purchase information about these stocks. As a result, investors should be more comfortable assessing foreign stocks.